So this shows how, how we're currently treating ocean life is having a devastating impact on animals, humans, and the environment. Although this very briefly touches on farmed fish, and um, the main focus of the documentary is on wild caught fish. But as our work is to protect animals that are farmed for food, our focus is on farmed fish, which is part of aquaculture. And so we're currently working to encourage empathy and respect and ultimately working to end the exploitation of aquatic animals while working on changes we can make in the short term to improve the lives of those already trapped in the system. And so what do we mean by aquatic animals? Well, aquatic animals are animals, either vertebrate or invertebrate, who live in water for most of their lifetime. They may breathe air or extract oxygen that dissolved in water through specialised organs called gills or directly through their skin. And so there's three types of aquatic animals that our work focuses on. The first one is fish. So there are over 33,000 known species of fish. And here we have salmon and catfish, which are both commonly farmed for food. The second area is decapods. So crabs, lobsters, prawns and shrimps. Um, and I'd also just again really recommend going back and watching Crustacean Compassion's uh, talk in this webinar series as they give a lot more information about this area and these amazing animals. And the third area is cephalopods, so squid and octopus as pictured here. And octopus farming is currently in development in several countries. Some of you may have also seen the documentary My Octopus Teacher. This shows how intelligent uh, octopus are and what excellent memory they have and they're actually very likely to die from stress in farming conditions so for this reason many experts and organizations are currently speaking out against farming them and so aquatic animals incorporate a number of unique and diverse species all with specific welfare needs and today i'll mostly be speaking about farmed fish so fish are the most farmed type of animal in the world more than half the fish that people eat is actually farmed fish. And the organization Fish, fish Count estimate that between 51 and 167 billion farmed fish were slaughtered for food globally in 2017. And the UK actually rears and slaughters up to 77 million fin fish per year. They're reared in large numbers in crowded conditions, which is a type of factory farm, either on land, in rivers or in lakes. And the vast majority of Atlantic salmon and rainbow trout consumed around the world are currently farmed intensively. Other species that are farmed include carp, catfish and sea bass. And so when thinking about our relationship with fish, how we relate to these animals and why we have the perceptions that we do, in her presentation for World Aquatic Animal Day, hosted by Lewis and Clark Law School, Dr. Becca Franks explores the reasons why we think about fish the way that we do. And this goes back to the thinking from philosophers such as Aristotle and the idea of hierarchy in animals with humans at the top and fish at the bottom of the hierarchy as inferior to even other animals. And this is very much consistent in society today. So there's definitely a separation from fish to other animals often people think about eating fish as perhaps not as bad as eating other animals. And this is reaffirmed by the common misconception that fish do not feel pain. This also relates to how fish are perhaps seen as hard to relate to and expressionless. This could also play a role in how they are viewed in wider society today. So this quote kind of really relates to this from Brian Curtis. When talking about a fish's face, he says, it is of no use for frowning or smiling. If the fish could do these things, it will receive a great deal more sympathy than it does. And this suggests that perhaps being less relatable to other animals as a reason people may struggle to feel as much empathy for fish. And this kind of starts us thinking about why legal protections are so important. The idea of fish as inferior to other animals as a society has translated into law. Therefore, this makes us question, should law be the first step in working towards changing perception of fish? And so next, when thinking about fish intelligence and what a fish knows, um, Jonathan Balcom is a biologist and author of the book, What a Fish Knows, that I definitely recommend to anybody that hasn't read it. And he talks about examples where fish have proven long-term memories, solve problems, learn to avoid harmful events or in order to survive. 
And one example he talks about is cleaner fish and their relationship with their clients. So cleaner fish provide a special service to their clients by removing dead skin, parasites and infected tissue. And in return, they get fed. And so this interaction very much benefits both parties involved. And some clients visit a specific cleaner fish up to 144 times a day. Cleaner fish also often clean inside the mouths of much larger predators, even sharks. So this is very much a relationship, a relationship based on trust and cultivated over a long time. This also requires cleaners to recognize their clients. Studies show cleaners can recognize more than 100 individual clients of various species and even remember their last interaction with them. And so cleaner fish are also more likely to clean a particular fish who missed their, missed their last appointment as they are likely to have more parasite buildup, i.e. more food for the cleaner fish. And so cleaner fish remember which client is the better one to clean by using memory along three dimensions, who, what, and when. This means they demonstrate episodic memory, which is a mental skill held in high regard by biologists. And when thinking about skills of other aquatic animals as well, um, octopus can solve puzzles, navigate mazes, and even open jars. Lobsters have sophisticated navigation skills, and cray crayfish have shown emotional behavior, such as anxiety and stress. And when we think about emotional behavior in fish a little more generally, there was an article um, published a few years ago in the New York Times called Fish Depression is Not a Joke. And this talks about how fish visibly show symptoms of depression. Dr. Cullen Brown, behavioral biologist at the University in Sydney, published over 100 papers on fish cognition. And he said he can tell if a fish is depressed because they act withdrawn, very similar to humans. He also praises the intelligence of fish and says that fish are more intelligent than they appear in many areas such as memory, their cognitive powers match or exceed those of higher vertebrates, including non-human primates. And so we've already touched on um, the memory, intelligence, and even emotional behavior of a fish. But is there any truth to the age old idea that fish don't feel pain? And so sorry, there is growing recognition within the scientific community that fish experience pleasure and pain, just like farmed land animals. The basis of the idea that fish do not feel pain is often what um, is often what Jonathan Balcom refers to as corticocentrism, which is the claim that to possess a human-like capacity for pain, one must have a neocortex, which is the cauliflower-like portion of the brain. Only brains of mammals have this, which follows that non-mammals lack consciousness. However, in 2012, a group of scientists met at Cambridge University to discuss current scientific understanding of animal consciousness, and they actually signed a declaration of consciousness which states that, number one, consciousness needn't require having a backbone. Number two, emotions also derive from parts of the brain outside the cortex. And number three, you don't need a big human-like brain to feel excited about food or scared of predators. And there's very much more scientific um, research surfacing on this all the time. This article was published just a few weeks ago, and it refers to a report published in the Journal of Science Advances. And this article says not only do fish feel pain, but failure to provide the right environment and to handle aquatic animals correctly can lead to birth defects, restricted mobility, aggressive behavior, and extreme pain during slaughter. So given the scientific consensus that fish feel pain and are sentient, much the same as other farmed animals, surely this would mean they would gain similar, similar legal protections, we would think. But let's look at the legal protections that are currently in place for aquatic animals. So first of all, during the life of fish, when looking at the legal protections that are in place, we need to first of all consider the Animal Welfare Act of 2006. And so this applies to farmed fish, affording them protection against unnecessary suffering, although there is lots of differing opinion as to what equates to unnecessary suffering, and requiring farmers to ensure their needs are met. However, another piece of key animal welfare legislation is the Welfare of Farmed Animals Regulations of 2007, and this expressly excludes fish from their definition of farmed animal, 
denying them the benefit of the detailed requirements contained in these regulations, so offering them no further protection. And there's been a lot of advice about changes that should be made to this legislation. The Farm Animal Welfare Committee is an expert committee of the Department for Environment, Food and Rural, Rural Affairs, also known as DEFRA, in England, Scotland and Wales, and reports to the government on contemporary topics relating to farmed animal welfare based on evidence and consultations. In 2014, the committee recommended that the welfare of farmed animals regulations should be extended to cover fish. There are also various non-statutory codes of practice However, these are voluntary and not legal protections, therefore not essential to follow. And the extent of compliance here is very unclear. So it seems that domestic legal protections for fish during life lag far behind the scientific consensus on the capacity of fish to suffer. But what are their protections during slaughter? So during slaughter, there are a few regulations to keep in mind. The first one is Article 3 of the European Council regulation, which states that, animals should be spared any avoidable pain, distress or suffering during their killing and related operations. However, this regulation lacks detailed provisions applicable to fish and this lack of clarity causes much confusion as to how fish suffering should be minimised at the time of slaughter. The Welfare of Animals at the Time of Killing Regulations 2015, also known as WATOP, do not contain detailed provisions capable of practically securing the Article 3 protections for aquatic animals. Without this, the regulations lack much use at all. And so the Farm Animal Welfare Committee again made a recommendation in 2014. Their report recommended remedying this by including detailed provisions for aquatic animals and with Brexit has come a new opportunity to finally correct this. So this shows that legal protection along with detailed provisions are essential to make any headway with protecting fish in law. So what is the result of the current lack of legal protections for aquatic animals at time of slaughter? Well, so we can see what this looks like, this leads us to our investigation. And so I won't actually be showing our investigation video today um, because the streaming it might be quite difficult, but I've included um, the link here. So I definitely invite you to watch it when you can. The footage reveals Scottish salmon suffering, prolonged pain in a Scottish salmon company slaughterhouse. And this is the first investigation video of its kind showing fish killing processes to be released in the UK. The Scottish salmon company supplies major UK supermarkets, Waitrose and co-op, alongside premium retailers, hotels, and restaurants. The corporation also has a large global reach, exporting its products to over 20 countries across the world. And looking a little bit more into what this investigation actually showed, if we look at the first picture here, we can see, so despite a stunning device being in place in this facility, numerous salmon actually displayed consciousness at the time of slaughter evidenced by flapping, wriggling, and gasping motions. Also, many salmon's gills were cut when they were still conscious, causing them to be in agony for up to several minutes as a result. Some salmon were stunned with a club after their gills were cut, causing their blood to spray out. In some instances, conscious animals were clubbed as many as seven times. And with so many animals entering the slaughterhouse, many fish fell or were thrown to the floor when the chute was full. Left to suffocate, their painful death was even more drawn out. So this shows that legal guidelines are crucial if the technology is to work as intended. The value of stunning equipment is diminished when improperly used. And all this leads to the most unimaginable and prolonged suffering in the last minutes of a, fish, of a fish's life. And also just to talk a little bit about Scottish produce. So Scottish produce is often perceived by consumers as synonymous with higher welfare and higher quality practices. Yet even with stunning machinery in use, these processes paint a picture of chaos and confusion without additional parameters in place, such as detailed laws and guidance. Like the Scottish Salmon Company, our understanding is that a number of Scottish aquaculture operators have already invested in stunning devices within their slaughterhouses. This investigation, however, brings into question whether the installation of such equipment is in itself serving the intended purpose. 
if used incorrectly, animals can face unimaginable prolonged suffering in their final moments. And so going back to why legal guidelines are so crucial, they're needed not just to secure the stunning equipment to reduce the risk of unnecessary suffering, but also to ensure the equipment works as intended. Otherwise, its presence is pointless if it's not even being used properly. And so I'm just gonna have a look at the science behind our concerns. So fish are particularly vulnerable to skin damage, especially when handled during slaughter processes. No receptors for detecting painful stimuli have been identified in fish and are strikingly similar to those found in mammals. The nociceptors are distributed over the head and face of fish, as well as across the body and the fins. In one study, the amount of pressure required to activate nociceptors in fish was found to be much lower than the threshold for human skin. And an expert in this area, Dr. Lynn Snedden said, this means what humans would regard as a light touch would be very painful to the fish. And so the ineffective clubbing by slaughterhouse staff captured in our footage would likewise cause considerable pain as would the cutting of the animal's gills. The World Organization for Animal, for animal Health, Aquatic Animal Health Code, to which the UK is subscribed, states that effective stunning should be verified by the absence of consciousness. And our footage very much shows that these standards are not being met. A large number of fish displaying persistent movement behaviours suggests that effective stunning is not being correctly verified by staff, suggesting that the machines are not being operated properly. And this again shows how important legislation is to provide clear and concrete guidance, as well as enforcement and regulation to check equipment is being operated properly. And so with all this in mind, this leads us to our demands. So to transform this expert knowledge and body of research into detailed legal standards, we urge each of the UK devolved governments to amend existing welfare of animals at the time of killing regulations with the following set of amendments. So number one, to set forth minimum welfare standards for each of the key pre-slaughter stages for aquatic animals. Number two, to include provisions for emergency killing methods for aquatic animals in facilities other than slaughterhouses, i.e. euthanasia of sick or injured individuals. Number three, to clearly specify effective stunning prior to or concurrent with cutting or bleeding, such that the animal is painlessly rendered insensible and unaware of being killed, including the required methods of stunning and slaughter for commonly found aquatic species, i.e. Each species will have different needs and not a one size fits all approach. Number four, to include certificate and licensing requirements for persons involved in carrying out aquatic animal killing operations to be granted only upon evidence that the applicant has sufficient training and knowledge of the provisions of all relevant legislation and guidance. And number five, and this really is the key one, to include a rigorous enforcement regime to ensure compliance with the rules, i.e. regular inspections by a public body. And so this leads us to what happened next. So what were the results of our investigation? Well, after our investigation launched, First of all, leading supermarkets, Waitrose and Co-op stopped supplies from the Scottish Salmon Company with immediate effect. And they said these will be halted, halted until they have carried out their own investigations into the company. We also sent an open letter to each of the devolved governments calling for meaningful, specific protections to be put in place for aquatic animals at the time of killing, signed by 70 world leading animal welfare experts, academics and animal protection organisations. And we sent complaints to both BAP, Best Agriculture Practices, and Global Gap Certification Schemes, both of which the Scottish Salmon Company are certified by. And just to give you an idea of the press coverage and reach of this investigation, um, here's a few examples of the press coverage that we gained. And our media work re reached almost 35 million people, whilst, whilst our social media reached around 150,000 people. 
And so when thinking about why this is important, well, this investigation allows the general public to see aquatic animals differently and debunks the myths that they that has been present in society for such a long time, i.e. the fish don't feel pain. It helps to encourage empathy and respect to these fascinating animals while showing the visual result of a lack of legal protections. And so I just wanted to give you a bit of an insight into the responses that we've had so far, so from the open letter that we sent. So the reply from DEFRA said that they were aware of the issues relating to farmed fish welfare, including at time of slaughter. And now that we have left the EU, we have an opportunity to discuss whether detailed regulation is needed. And we're currently having ongoing conversations with them. With the Welsh government, they noted the important points raised in our letter and investigation and agreed to meet with us after the elections. And with the government of Northern Ireland, they said they had no current plans to bring forward legislation on this matter, but we'll keep this under review. And with the Scottish government, they had no immediate plans to look at legislation at time of slaughter, but will consider recommendations from the British Veterinary Association and the Animal Welfare Committee when they do. Unfortunately, they gave no acknowledgement of our investigation or clear breaches of certification schemes. And so the Twitter action that some of you are taking part in today, this is why this is so important. So, Progress with one of these devolved governments will put pressure on the other governments to act. And we're currently very much urging the Scottish government to acknowledge the importance of this issue and to make it a higher priority to address this given the extent to which aquatic animals are currently suffering. So your action today is very much helping us to achieve this. And I also just wanna to touch very briefly on voluntary schemes. So although there is some value to certification schemes, they're not legally binding. They rely very heavily on self-regulation and our investigation shows that this is not effective in itself. We need legislation to hold the industry to account. And I mentioned that we submitted complaints to the two certification schemes and the responses that we've had are that best aquaculture practice will be carrying out future in, um, further inspect inspections and the Global Gap Aquaculture Standard will be looking into updating current regulations and are planning to put in place more unannounced inspections. They also acknowledge that their scheme didn't previously include specific animal welfare guidelines and will also be reviewing this. And so in summary, the question we had at the beginning was why are legal protections so critical? Well, ultimately we are working to end the exploitation of aquatic animals and encourage the, encouraging the public to see these animals differently. One clear and undeniable area for improvement for those trapped in the system is slaughter. And this is why we're pushing for this very reasonable ask. Fish and other aquatic animals are currently receiving far less protections in law than other farmed animals, although there is strong scientific consensus that, they've, that they feel pain and have the ability to suffer. Aquatic animals are facing prolonged suffering at the time of killing due to the lack of legal guidance and enforcement. And the UK now has an ideal opportunity to change this, setting an example for the rest of the world. So a change in law leads to a change in wider society, moving towards a world where aquatic animals are respected and protected. And this picture here also, also shows Alex Gold, who's actually the voice of Finding Nemo. And he's an avid supporter of our work um, in this area to protect fish and other animals. And again, this is helping us to reach the wider masses to promote empathy towards fish. And so finally, how can you help? Well, first of all, thank you again to everybody today who has um, taken part in our action. And this is an example of an action that we regularly share with our animal protectors, holding governments and companies to account with actions that are quick and easy, but add up to make a huge impact. So I very much invite you to join our animal protectors network. Um, I've included the link here, which is quite easy to find on our website. 
Also, you can sign up to our newsletter um, to be kept up to date with all our latest work and investigations. And another really positive action we can all take is to leave fish and all animals off our play if we have the option to do so. And our Love Veg website has some useful animal free recipes that you may find helpful on your journey if this is something you're considering. And you can also follow us on social media at Animal Equality UK. And I've also just included um, a few resources here, some of the things I've spoken about today. And I highly recommend looking into the work of some of the experts that I've mentioned um, during my talk. For example, Dr. Becca Franks, um, she did a presentation for World Aquatic Animal Day for Lewis and Clark Law School, um, which has just been uploaded on the Center for Animal Law, um, for Animal Law Studies YouTube channel. So you can view that there. And that talks a little bit more about why we think about fish the way that we do. Also, I just wanted to mention um, World Aquatic Animal Day. So this is an awareness day that has been created by Lewis and Clark Law School and its Aquatic Animal Law Initiative, helping to raise awareness on the issues facing aquatic animals. If you'd like to learn more about this particular area, I'll soon be hosting a Q&A session with prof professors and experts in aquatic animal law from Lewis and Clark too. Um, if you'd like more information of this, please sign up to our newsletter. This is very much a huge world of research and thinking in this area, which is really fascinating. And it's only due to this important research that we are able to carry out our work as well. So also, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, just a huge thanks to all the groups, including One Kind, who are currently working in this really important area. Uh, thank you for listening. And thanks so much for your interest in aquatic animals. Um, I've included my email address here, so very happy to further discuss this with anybody that wants to know more and happy to answer a few questions today as well.